Okay, let's introduce our keynote speaker this morning. He holds five invention patents, is the youngest person named the 2018 Forbes 30 Under 30 Science List. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Peyton Robertson. Thank you so much. There once was a uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist who was on a speaking tour. This physicist had been to so many stops, but unlike most physicists, he was actually afraid of flying. And that's kind of rare for a physicist. He probably understood a lot about aerodynamics. So he had a driver who drove him to each and every location. And the driver had heard the speech that the physicist gave so many times that the driver said, well, I think I can just give the speech for you at this point. I've done it so many times, I can do it. So they have a bet. And they say, well, how about the driver will give the speech and the physicist will sit in the back in the driver's uniform. And no one will know because he's heard the words, he can say it absolutely identically. So that's what they do. The driver gives the presentation, the physicist in the back, it goes absolutely perfectly. And then a student who's sitting in the front has a insightful question, but it takes like five minutes to explain. And it requires calculus and math that the driver didn't really understand. So he has to think for a minute. And then without batting an eye, he turns to his driver, um, the driver in the back and says, that question is so easy, I'll let my driver answer it for you. <laughs> and the moral of the story is that's kind of how I feel today because you guys are all so inspiring and all the amazing work which you guys do and the guidance that you're able to give. I'm like the driver who's the, uh, the imposter on stage. But regardless, hopefully I'll be able to uh, say something interesting. So that's the goal for today. I have three different formulas for young inventors. Formulas, because I put them in, I guess, vaguely mathematical terms. And the first of these is that ideas are greater than age and circumstance. So we're going to be putting a priority on ideas and the ideas that you have instead of like the age or background or facticity of the person. And to give some examples for this, someone like Peter Chilvers, who designed the first windsurfing sailboard at just 12 years old. Philo Farnsworth, who drafted his sketch of the TV, just 14 years old. And finally, a name you might recognize, Louis Braille, who invented the Braille alphabet at just 15 years old. So that's super impressive, at least I think. At this young age, he was able to come up with this amazing idea. And let's look at him in more depth. He spent a lot of time in his father's workshop. And his father's had a leather working, shoemaking workshop. And he used this tool that's called an awl. And it's quite dangerous, especially for a three-year-old Louis Braille. So he's poking holes in the leather, and eventually the awl slips, and it pokes him in the eye, and it gets infected, and the infection spreads to the other eye, and then he's blind at just five years old. Louis Braille did not let this circumstance be the end of his idea. In fact, it was kind of the starting point for his idea because he had to learn how to read and he couldn't see. So he learned about how to read using raised letters, like where you take a page and you rub your finger across it and you see the texture of the letters to see what the text is, right? And then he also learned about a military communication system, which is called night writing, that our people in the army used, kind of similar to Morse code, but it allows you to communicate without light and with more secrecy. Louis Braille learned about all of this. And then he thought, well, how can I make this better? And he applied it to the French alphabet. And he did this using the very instrument that blinded him, the awl. And he poked little holes in a piece of paper. So then when one rubbed your finger across it, you could see exactly the texture and associate that texture and combination of dots with a letter. And that gave him the French alphabet. And then all he did from here is extend it to English and to science and to music theory and to anyone who basically wanted to see things on a page but couldn't actually see. So through his circumstance, he overcame it through an idea. And in fact, he used the circumstance as a type of innovation opportunity, an opportunity to innovate and try something new and make things better for people for years to come. And that leads me into my next formula, right? How problems encountered can be considered innovation opportunities. That's what matters. It's about 
taking the problem that you have or the circumstance and considering it as an opportunity. And what that requires is the correct mindset. It's all about the way you see it. And you should have this mindset by having a process for capturing your ideas. You have a unique path through your life. You will have unique problems that no one else has had, or that problem might have been posed in a different way than has been posed before. So you'll come across novel problems and novel angles, which will give you novel solutions. So you can't just forget about these and say, well, I don't know, someone else can solve it for me in 10 years, or once I get a PhD, then I'll be able to solve it. I mean, maybe, but you could go ahead, right? Go ahead and write them down. Keep a list. Send a text to yourself. Do whatever you need to do to make sure that the ideas that you have don't go to waste. Once you have this process for capturing ideas, it's important that you're able to invent from your life experiences. Focus on what you know. And an example of this and using life experiences to your advantage comes in the form of yet another story. In the 19th century, surgeons didn't wash their instruments, right? The theory of medicine and about the human body was based off of the ancient humoral theory, which had to do with the body restoring itself to health after an imbalance of humor. So all the doctors would really do is they would give you rest and give you some herbs and say, well, get better. Your body has to restore itself. And that's all great until people started doing surgery. And then if it's just about your body, then there was no need to wash the instruments. You could do an operation on one person and then on the next, and it shouldn't matter. But then Louis Pasteur came along, and Pasteur said that it's actually about these tiny little microorganisms that you can't even really see. They're so tiny, but they're actually causing disease. And no one believed him because it seemed kind of unfalsifiable. Like, how would I know if there was a microorganism? How could I ever test that? But he had some good evidence, and he went lecturing, and eventually Joseph Lister believed him. And Joseph Lister was just a practicing surgeon, and he had learned about germ theory, this microbiology, but no one believed him. So no one would let him apply his techniques. And this was all until Joseph Lister's sister got sick and needed surgery, and no one would do it because she would require open wound surgery, which could easily get infected. It always got infected because the surgeons always used the same instruments. So he tried something new. He said, I'm going to develop my new technique based off of this new ideology that Pasteur inspired, and it worked. It was a successful surgery. She was healed. It didn't get infected. So then well, his ideas spread, right? And eventually Queen Victoria in England needed surgery. And he used this same technique, and he healed her, and it went great. And this made him totally famous. So he went lecturing in Europe and then in America, and eventually one of his lectures was attended by a Mr. Johnson, who happened to have a brother also named Mr. Johnson, and together they founded Johnson & Johnson, who make antiseptic surgical products. And one of the brands which Johnson & Johnson makes that you might be familiar with is Listerine, and it's named after Joseph Lister, the person who inspired their initial idea for their company, right? This new antiseptic surgical technique. And so now the point of this is that when you see Listerine, you should think about the problems that Joseph Lister encountered and how he turned that into an opportunity. I have a personal experience with encountering problems and making them opportunities. And this is in the form of a invention that I made for a bike. When my sisters, when they were about five years old, they were learning how to ride a bike. And they had to make this trade-off that's really tough because either you have to ride a bike normally and you get that feeling of balance, but it takes quite a while and you're going to get hurt. You're going to scrape your knee. You're going to hurt yourself, most likely. Or you can use training wheels on a bicycle, but then you won't actually get the feeling of balancing your body weight, right? You're going to kind of rely on the training wheels more than you should. So what I designed was a retractable training wheels, which allow you to get the best of both universes. All you have to do is, when you feel confident, you turn the handlebar, and the wheels come up, and it's like a bike. And then you push the retraction button, and it comes back down, and then you can't hurt yourself. So that's the idea here. It was a 
I would say pretty simple problem, or a problem that a lot of people still tell me that they have learning how to ride a bike, and you turn it into a solution which can be innovative and be an opportunity and something that can really help people for years to come. Perhaps not the same extent as Joseph Lister did, but helping people nonetheless. After this concept, right, so after seeing the problem as an opportunity, the design was tested, it was refined, it was patented, it has five patents on it, and now a license is being negotiated with a kid's bike manufacturer. So with all of these parts, eventually a problem that was encountered hopefully was developed into an innovation opportunity. The final formula for young inventors is the combination of failure and action is equivalent to progress. That's what I mean by addition here. <laughs> failure plus action is progress. And let's start with failure. So failure on its own clearly is not progress, right? That would be a contradiction. Using the two words in a little bit of a different sense. So failure as short-term failure and progress in the long-term sense. Short-term failure is long-term progress. And how is that the case? Well, it's the case because it actually builds the muscle of resilience. And I'm citing Adam Grant here, who's a psychologist, and says that we are not born with any amount of resilience. We're not born with an ability to make our failures successes. But instead, it's a muscle that we have to build. And we only build the muscle of resilience by exercising it, just like any other muscle. Think about like when you work out, right? What you're doing is you're breaking down your muscle tissue, and then it rebuilds even stronger. And that's what you have to do with resilience. Failure breaks down your resilience muscle, right? And then it builds back even stronger than it once was. So that's the value of resilience. And resilience allows you to pivot to a new idea when something has gone wrong. It allows you to be dedicated to what you're doing, as all of you guys are, be dedicated to your progress and not give up. But at the same time, when something isn't quite going right, sometimes it's important to make a switch. And that's what resilience allows you to do, to not see the failure as impossible to overcome or make it your personal mission for the rest of your life to be stuck on the same problem. You should pivot when it's necessary. You see this a lot of time with social media companies. And for example, Odeo was a subscription service for podcasts. And you've probably never heard of this. And that's because its niche was taken over by iTunes. So Odeo then had to say, what can we do differently? And they had a brainstorming session, and they said, why don't we make it a microblogging platform? Perhaps people would use more than Odeo. And eventually, it became what we now know as Twitter. So you see this as well. The point, this was a socially good fundraising site. It allows you to make donations, and once enough people made a donation, there would be a tipping point, and a lot of social good would be done. And this was a great idea. It wasn't necessarily unsuccessful, but the founders wanted to expand it to what they saw as local deals, where they had less community-wide events. So once enough people signed up for an event, you would get a discount. That was the, the concept. And now they have over 500 million active customers. And we now know it as Groupon. So this slight change allowed them to make something that maybe was successful, but not quite as successful, into something that was super successful, just by making a little pivot. And finally, Bourbon was a check-in app. It had to do with gaming elements and photo elements, and you've likely never heard of it as well. And that's because it was very cluttered. So the developers recognized this, and they said, how can we reduce the clutter? How can we make it more focused? So they eliminated everything except for just the photo sharing. And now it has 800 million active users, and we know it as Instagram. So a huge pivot there. Seeing failure is progress in order to pivot. That's the first point. And I have a personal experience with failure and progress as well. And this is in the form of a golf device, which I invented in response to a USGA golf rule change that was going to come into effect in 2019. It used to be that if you hit your ball in a water hazard, right, or on a sprinkler head, you would have to drop your ball within club length. So you would use your club and you would measure it, and then drop your ball within that zone. 
But the USGA, which is like the governing body for golf, said that this really isn't fair because if you're too tall or if your clubs are too long, you might get different types of advantages. So they said, let's standardize the metric. Let's make it 20 inches or 80 inches, depending on the circumstance, for everyone. The problem is that there's nothing in a golf bag that's exactly 20 inches. So how are you going to get the most out of your situation? So I designed the drop stick, which is a convertible alignment stick. A lot of people use alignment sticks for golf anyway and have it in their bag. So I designed this alignment stick, and you can expand it and then put the ends together, right? And then you can use it to measure a 20-inch distance from the center point. So you put it down and then drop your golf ball. So from there, I built prototypes like this one. I had to redesign it for cost, to produce it in mass. I had to get a USGA stamp of approval on it, and they said it would be totally legal to use on the golf course and during tournaments for this purpose. I went to the PGA Super Show, where I presented the product, made a lot of interesting connections, and I took over 1,000 pre-orders for this device. And this was amazing until the USGA reversed the change. And they said, no, we're going to go back to club legs. So all of the dropsticks now are a little bit less useful for all of the people who took pre-orders. Because now, why would you buy this thing if you can just measure it with your club? So now, I guess what I have to do is think about how I can pivot, because maybe there's other uses for this device that expands into a quarter circle. I have to be thinking about that. So regardless, the experience of failure is valuable, as difficult as it may be to admit, because it allows you to get these connections, uh, have these experiences. That's what matters. So moving on from failure, it's important to have an action bias which goes along with the failure, because failure on its own really isn't sufficient. And what I mean by an action bias is an instinct to act as opposed to inact or not act, right? There's many reasons why you might not want to act, why you might say, you know, someone else can solve this problem or I'll come back to it later. But you might have many excuses for yourself, but you have to recognize that those are really just excuses. But the first problem that you're going to be solving, the first problem that you're going to be thinking through in your head isn't really the right problem. Because you might say, well, how can I approach this? And this might give you another angle on this. And then eventually, you will end up with an actionable protocol, an actionable question that you can try to answer. And once you get to that point, then you might be really committed. But the tough part is getting committed in the first place to getting that motivation. So you have to start before you might think you're entirely ready to start. And the advantage for doing this is that you're going to learn faster. You're going to get luckier. You're going to get better help if you start early. If you start and be committed and know that you're going to get to an actionable question later, you will get unexpected connections, unexpected experiences, people who can help you, people who you can bounce your ideas off of. And that is all extraordinarily valuable. And that gives you this action bias, and it gives you momentum. You can progress more rapidly and get better ideas more quickly. But it all comes down to starting and wanting to start. So not being set back by the failure and turning it into an action bias. So going back through, ideas are greater than age and circumstance. Remember Braille, who transformed his circumstance to an idea and changed it from a problem to an opportunity. So remember that with Listerine, Joseph Lister, and using the germ theory to solve a problem and making it an opportunity to save a lot of lives and then combining failure and action to create progress. Remember social media companies and how they pivoted, and remember to start before you think you have all of the answers. So those are the three formulas for young inventors. Thank you guys so much for having me today. Congratulations on all of your achievements. You guys are so inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.